And I appreciate the opportunity to stand before you and uh, speak to you about certain things. I do regret the uh, necessity for it. Um, but nevertheless, here I am. <laughs> so I want to read a passage for you, too. And if you would, it would be a good idea for you just to turn over there and read along with me. It's uh, Ezekiel, the 33rd chapter, verses 1 through 5. And it says there, again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land and the people of the land, uh, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears <coughs> the sound of the trumpet and does not take a warning. If the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take a warning. His blood shall be upon himself, but he who takes warning will save his life. Now I want you to remember that, because we're going to get back to that, and you'll see where I'm going with this. <clears throat> but you see that? little thing right there it's a yellow number two pencil now it's really quite ordinary marvelous little invention but it's really quite ordinary and uh, those of us <coughs> who grew up without computers are quite familiar with this little writing instrument now I doubt that we thought about it much at all and you probably don't think about it much at now, but it, it is a remarkable device. Uh, we wouldn't call it mechanical, I don't think, but uh, it involves a lot of mechanics to bring it about. A unique th thing about the common pencil, uh, pencil is that no one gives any thought about how it came, to, uh, came about, do you? It's a wooden pencil. <clears throat> so where did the wood come from? Well, of course, a lot of trees in the Pacific Northwest, so maybe it came from there. I, I don't know, but uh, somebody had to cut the tree, and it had to be an axe or saw of some sort. Somebody had to produce the axe or saw. <clears throat> Someone not involved in cutting trees, I'm pretty sure. Someone had to mill the tree in these little, uh, they're really halves, little halves that uh, make up the wooden part of the pencil. <clears throat> and you see that little uh, black, little black thing in the middle of it? We call that lead. But it's not lead, and it's not the metallic lead, you know, that goes in to make bullets and what have you. It's graphite. Now somebody had to mine that graphite, and I don't know where graphite mines are, maybe South America, Asia, I don't know where they are. But they had to mine that graphite, and they had to take that graphite to a processing plant and compress it, because this is compressed graphite. And there's a, a means to make it hard or soft, or what have you. Number two is kind of a semi-soft lead. Um, you see this little metal thing on top here? It's called a ferrule. Now this particular ferrule, ferrule is made of aluminum, but it's, you know, some are made of steel, but this is made of aluminum. I checked it with the magnets. <laughs> So bauxite had to be mined somewhere, and of course it may be in the Caribbean. I know there are bauxite mines in the Caribbean. And that bauxite had to be uh, processed somewhere. It had to be smelted somewhere. I know there's an uh, aluminum smelter over in Rockdale, Texas. Yeah, I, think, I think it may have been idle now, but there at least was a, a bauxite uh, smelter over there, so they had to make it in a sheet, aluminum. They had to send that sheet to to somebody that makes ferals. And you see that little red thing on top? That doesn't last as long as the rest of the pencil, typically. 
It's an eraser. There's a little rubber in that eraser. Now, where does that rubber come from? Most likely from a rubber tree in Asia, Philippines, Indonesia, somewhere over there. So let's just say it comes from Southeast Asia. That, that'll uh, suffice. But all these things have to come together at the pencil manufacturer to make this pencil. And then there's got to be distribution of all that. And somehow it's got to get to the store for you to buy this pencil. Now, so there's a lot of people that are instrumental in the production of this pencil. But you know one thing that's interesting about all this, this pencil? They all acted in their own self-interest. They had no idea who you are or what, to what intent you in, uh, intended to put to all these components that they uh, um, produced. They didn't know each other. They may have been different nationalities, different religions, different uh, social circumstances. In fact, if they knew one another, they may not have liked each other. They may have been fighting. And they don't really care what you do with this pencil. They don't care if you come up with something like uh, e, e, e equals uh, mc squared or whether you just don't use it to scratch your head. They don't care. They acted out of their own self-interest. You acted out of your own self-interest in buying the pencil and the use to what you uh, put it. So we act out of our own self-interest. And that's a good thing. That's how the economic system works and so much of other things. I want people to act out of their own self-interest. Now, the prophet uh, Jeremiah had to speak the word of God. He was acting out of his own self-interest. It was like a burning fire shut up in his bones, and he couldn't hold it back. Look at uh, Jeremiah, the 20th chapter, verse 9. Even Paul said, Woe is me if I do not preach the gospel, 1 Corinthians 9.16. Both were doing things that caused them hardship, but they had to preach or it would have destroyed them, uh, or destroyed who they were anyway. Self-interest then can be based on some noble or selfish motive. Self-interest may be characterized by self-control or indulgence, virtue or vice. Everyone who, let's say, let's take the extreme, everyone who commits suicide is acting out of self-interest. You say, how can that be? Well, it's a wrong-headed self-interest, we would all admit, but such one thinks in a convoluted and erroneous way that his suicide is the best way to, to uh, resolve some perceived problem. He's acting out of his what he thinks is a self-interest. In worldly affairs, men always seem to understand and pursue their own interest, and that's where the economic system works. It's usually financial. It's uh, demonstrated by the example of the pencil. If any supplier of one of the pencil components determines he will either be a gainer or a loser by providing that component, he will act accordingly. Of course, in politics, self-interest, or we might substitute power for self-interest, is a typical motivation. Men will always be looking out for their own self-interest. It should be the same in religion, but it is not, or I should say seldom the case. In religion, men believe abstract doctrines rather than the practical, that is how doctrine applies to them. And they talk of general truths rather than a self-examination of their own application of truth to themselves. Many praise the preacher who deals in generalities, but when he presses home certain, certain uh, searching questions, they are offended. 
If we stand and declare general truths such as Romans 3.23, Acts 2.38, or Hebrews 10.25, people will readily give us assent and possibly say, like the Ethiopian eunuch, uh, or they, I should say they may, like the Ethiopian eunuch, retire greatly delighted, thinking it has not affected them. <clears throat> I'm reminded about the preacher at a congregation in uh, Kentucky that preached on the sin of drinking alcoholic beverages. Well, he was kind of taken to the side and say, uh, said, you know, don't preach about uh, alcohol since uh, Kentucky is a principal distiller of whiskey and some of the members derive income from that industry. Uh, so the preacher delivered a sermon on the evils of tobacco. <clears throat> and it was once, he, was, uh, he was once again advised not to preach on that subject since some members grew tobacco. So he asked, well, you know, exactly what can I preach on? He said, well, preach on witches. They're not one of those in 100 miles a year. There was not one of those there. And that demonstrates how often the audience will gnash their teeth and go away in a rage because, like the Pharisees with Jesus, they perceived that a faithful gospel preacher spoke of them. And if they think that, then the preacher was speaking of them. So how foolish and illogical is this? If in all other matters we looked to our own concerns, our own interests, how much more should we do so in religion? For surely every man must give an account to himself on that day of judgment. We are born as an individual, and we must die as an individual. We must rise at the day of resurrection, one by one, and individually appear before the bar of God. And each one individually will rejoice on hearing the word said to him, again, as an individual, come you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom and prepare for you from the foundations of the world. Matthew 25, verse 34. Or else he must be appalled with a thundering sentence Depart from me, you cursed, at the, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, 25th chapter, verse 41. Those are the only two options. It would be so foolish then for us to neglect our own personal interest. If the sheep must, each one of them individually, pass under the hand of him who counts them, if every man must stand in, in his own person before God to be tried for his own acts by everything that is rational, by everything that conscience would dictate and self-interest would command, let us each of us look to ourselves that we are not deceived and that we find not ourselves at last miserably cast away. Now this morning I shall labor to be personal. Understand that I am preaching to you. And if there's anything that is personal and pertinent to you, I beseech you as a life and death matter, please let it have its full weight. And do not begin to think that it applies to your neighbor and not to you. Perhaps it may be even more pertinent to him, but do not be distracted by his needs until you have met your own. The text is a solemn one. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take a warning. His blood shall be upon himself. The first heads up is this. The warning was all that could be desired. He heard the sound of the trumpet. Secondly, the excuses for not attending to the startling warning are all both frivolous and wicked. And in third place, 
the consequences of inattention must be terrible because man's blood must then be on his own head. Let's first uh, think about the warning that uh, was all that uh, could be desired. In time, you've all seen movies and so forth. In time of war, an army operating in hostile territory uh, during the night will post uh, one or more soldiers to keep watch for the enemy. You used to see this in westerns, you know, keep look out for the uh, Indians and what have you, but the war movies too that post uh, centuries. They do that while the others went to sleep. Now, if on the approach of the enemy, the sentinels gave sufficient warning in whether they used uh, trumpets or whatever method they used, and the sleeping soldiers awake and meet the attack, but were overrun, we would lament their defeat, but we would attach uh, blame to no one, though we should deeply regret the loss of our soldiers. But if, on the other hand, the sentinels had properly uh, were properly uh, posted, they had detected the approach uh, of the enemy, and they gave to the sleeping soldiers uh, every warning that could be desired, but nevertheless the troops failed to awaken and consequently were destroyed. We would even then regret the loss thereof, yet at the same time we would be obliged to say if they were ne negligent enough to continue their slumber when the sentinels had warned them, if they persisted in their sloth after they had had sufficient and timely notice of the approach of their enemy, then in their dying, we cannot pity them. Their blood must rest upon their own heads. So it is with you. If men perish un, under an unfaithful ministry and have not been sufficiently warned to escape from the wrath to come, the Christian may pity them, although the fact of their not having been warned will not fully excuse them. Jesus said, Woe to you, Chorazin, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the judgment than for you, Luke 10, chapter verses 13 through 14. Now, although it may be more tolerable for unwarned Tyre and Sidon and the day of judgment than it was for any other city or any other nation that has had the gospel proclaimed in its ears, how does that help you? Are there degrees of punishment in hell? Well, that is an academic question uh, to which there is no consequential answer. After all, what does it matter if the unwarned are five degrees cooler than the, than the, uh, the warned or five degrees cooler than the unwarned, hell is hell. One condition is not more tolerable than the other. If on the other hand we have been warned, if our preachers have been declared the, uh, they have been declared, you know, the whole counsel of God, and here they have. And if they have appealed to our consciences and have constantly and earnestly called our attention to the fact of the wrath to come, and here they have. And if we have not attended to the message, if we have despised the word of God, if we have turned a deaf ear to their earnest exhortations, if we perish, we shall die warned. We shall die under the call of the gospel, and our damnation must be an unpitied one. Our blood must fall upon our own heads. Do not persist <coughs> in the delusion that the warning has been insufficient in the case of many of you. In the first place, the warning inherent in the preaching of the gospel has been warnings that you have heard. He heard the sound of the trumpet. In most churches of the day, including the Lord's church, the trumpet sound of warning is not heard. Most are hearing a different gospel, Galatians 1 verse 6, a gospel of smooth words and flattering speech which deceive the hearts of the simple, Romans 16, chapter verse 18, who know not that wrath abides on them, and who do not yet understand the only way and method of salvation 
his obedience to the gospel once delivered to the saints. But in this auditorium, it's very different. Uh, you have heard the word of God preached to you. You cannot say when you come before God, Lord, I knew no better. There is not a man or woman in this place who may plead ignorance. You have heard the gospel. Lamentably, there are some of you not an inch near heaven. You have made your own condemnation doubly sure unless you repent and obey. For you have heard the gospel, yet you have despised its truth, and you have rejected the counsel of God contained therein against yourselves. And therefore you shall die with your blood on your own head. Do you not hear the trumpet? Do you not understand its warning? When the slumbering man in the text heard the trumpet, he understood by it that the enemy was at hand. And yet he took no warning. Can you suppose that the sound of the gospel warning has been misunderstood? A thousand faults the preacher may have, but there is one fault from which he is entirely free. The words were perfectly understood. You have been told, you plainly, told plainly that unless you repent, you must perish. That unless you obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, there is no hope of salvation for you. The warning has been frequent. If the man heard the trumpet sound once and did not regard it, possibly we might excuse him. But this audience has heard the trumpet sound of the gospel frequently. You have had many years of a pious mother's teaching, many years of a pious minister's exhortations. Wagon loads of sermons have been exhausted upon you. Providence has led you here many times. To you, warnings are not an unusual thing. They are very common. Without the gospel, a man is lost. But if he would hear the gospel but once and, re and reject it, how lamentable would that be? His blood would be upon his own head for rejecting it. But how much sore punishment shall you, you be thought worthy we have heard the gospel call many times and still reject it. A hundred times you have heard the message of salvation and all you have done is added a few more chunks of firewood to the eternal pile. Every, repeal, every appeal rejected is a rejection of your eternal interest. If a preacher had but once poured out his heart before you concerning your eternal interest, and you had rejected the message, your eternal guilt would have been made more certain. But there will come a time when the shafts of the Almighty have been exhausted. What shall be done unto him who has been uh, rebuked and but still hardens his neck? What will happen to him? Shall he not be suddenly destroyed without remedy? Yes, and it shall be said, his blood shall be upon his own head. Although this warning has come to you in time, the day may come when you may call and he will refuse, when you may stretch out your hands and he will not regard you. But as he said in the book of Proverbs, so will he do. Because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no one regarded because you disdained all my counsel and would have none of my rebuke, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock you when your terror comes. That's in the first chapter of Proverbs, verse 24 to 26. But as we see it here this day, your warning has not come too late. You are warned in time. You are warned today. You have been warned for these many years that are now past. God will not send a preacher to those in hell. However, to preach the gospel to you now is to preach that there is hope. For Paul wrote, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you not to receive the race of God in vain. For he says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. 
Behold, now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verse 1 and 2. We have been then warned, uh, we have then warned you in time, and so much more shall your uh, guilt be increased because you, the warning was timely. It was frequent, it was earnest, it was appropriate, it was arousing, it was continually given to you, and yet you did not seek to escape from the wrath to come. Men, of course, make excuses why they do not attend to the gospel warning, but these excuses are frivolous and wicked. There is no excuse that is sufficient when one's soul is concerned. Of those who hear the trumpet, some will say that there was not any necessity to heed its warning. <clears throat> we have told you that after death there is a judgment, and you did not believe it. That there was a necessity, there was any necessity to prepare for that judgment. The writer of Romans 8, chapter verse 2, said, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And you did not think there was any necessity for Christ? Well, you ought to have thought there was a necessity. You will in time believe the warning, but it will be too late. The Lord himself said that every knee will bow to him and every tongue shall confess to God. Romans 14, chapter verse 11. And you can also look at Philippians 2, chapter verse 10. <clears throat> there was enough evidence presented to you to have taught you that there is a life beyond this temporal body. The revelation of Jesus Christ was plain enough to have taught that to you. If you had rejected God's word, which is the, the voice of reason. Your blood is on your own head. Perhaps you did not like the trumpet. Well, what God, uh, God made the trumpet. God made the gospel. And since you did not, did not like what God made, it's just an idle excuse. What was it to you what the trumpet was? <clears throat> just so long as you heard the sound. In war, it would have had mattered if the trumpet was brass or silver. No, it is the warning that the sound of the trumpet conveys. That's the important thing. That is what matters. It decides life or death. And surely, if it had been time of war, and you heard the, the trumpet to warn you of the coming of the enemy, you would not have sat idly by no, but the sound would have been enough for you. And you had been aroused to escape from the danger. And so it must be now for you. If you did not like it, well, you ought to have liked it. For God made the gospel what it is. Do not be deluded by the false notion that the trumpet sound was blown for everybody but you. All men think all men are mortal but themselves. And all men think all other men need the gospel except for themselves. Let each of us remember <clears throat> that the message uh, of the gospel is to each one of us. So what does the gospel say to you? What says the word of God to you? Forget your neighbors. Ask this question. Does the gospel condemn you? We read the words of Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Are you included in the each one? Well, yes, you are. If the gospel was not for you, why did Jesus say, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16 and 15. Are you one of the every creature? If it is to be preached to every creature in the heaven, there must be something in it for every creature, including you. Well, says another, I was uh, so busy. I had so much to do that I could not possibly attend to my soul's concern. If any man is so busy he loses his own soul for lack of time, <clears throat> let him consider the question asked by Jesus. 
For what will a man profit if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Mark 8, chapter, verse 36 and 37. The reality is that you have the time, will you not, when you are busy in the affairs of the world, be thinking of your soul? The glory to come will last an eternity. Therefore, what is time? The same is true of condemnation. As the Apostle Peter wrote, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. 1 Peter, the fifth chapter, verse 6 and 7. <clears throat> These are all idle excuses. <clears throat> Men typically do not make such excuses when their welfare, bodily or economic, is concerned. If they take no warning, whatever their excuse, their blood must be upon their own heads. Well, the last thought of uh, the passage of consideration is his blood shall be upon his own head. He shall perish. He shall certainly perish. He shall inexcusably perish. He shall perish. And what does that mean? There is no human mind, however spacious, that can, be, that can ever fully comprehend the thought of a soul eternally cast away from God. The wrath to come is, is as inexpressible as the glory that shall be revealed hereafter. Our Savior labored for words uh, with which to express the horrors of the future state of the ungodly. He talked of worms that die not, of fires that are never quenched, of a pit without a bottom, of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, of the outer darkness. There was never a preacher who was as loving as Christ. But no man ever spoke so horribly about hell as did Christ. And yet even when the Savior had said his best and said his worst, he had not told us the full horrors of the eternity of the lost state. Is the suffering of the lost merely a, a mental anguish? Well, mental anguish, yes. But the body will have to suffer forever as well. Matthew 10, 38, we read, He is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Unless we obey each of us, we will perish. All that is meant by that word hell must be realized in me unless I am an obedient servant. And so all that is meant by depart from me, you cursed, Matthew 25, 41, 41 must be yours unless you humbly turn unto God with, with a full purpose of heart. But again, he that turns not at the rebuke, rebuke of the preacher shall die, and he shall die certainly. This is not a matter of perhaps or chance. The things we preach and that are taught in the scriptures are matters of, of solemn certainty. If there is a world in which men live, then there is another world to come. And if one dies in, impenitent, that world to come will, will be one of misery from which there will be no escape. If there were hope that in the world to come men might escape, we not be, need not be so earnest in our messaging. But since once lost, lost forever, once cast away, cast away without hope, without any prospect of hope, we must be earnest. We cannot be sure that we shall be found pilgrims in this world for even another seven days. It may be me, or it may be you. It may be the gray heads or there may be the young lads. I don't know which, nor can I tell. Only God knows. Then let each one ask himself, am I prepared should I be called to die this day? You may die where you are, on the benches where you're sitting, and you may die on the roadways. You know, pretty bad out there. 
In this case, where would you go? And remember, where you go, you go forever. Am I prepared? Are you prepared? Prepared or not, death admits of no delay. And if death is at my door, it will take me where I must go forever, prepared or not. Now the unrepentant sinner will perish. He will perish certainly, but he will perish without excuse. His blood shall be on his own head. And let every man remember that if he perishes, he will be his own murderer. If you despise the gospel, <clears throat> you, are preparing, you are preparing fuel for your own bed of flames. You are hammering out the chain for your own everlasting binding. And when condemned, your mournful reflection will be this. I have done this to myself. I cast myself into this pit of hell. For I rejected the gospel. I despised the message. I trod underfoot the Son of Man. I would have none of his rebukes. I despised his servants. I would not listen to his exhortations. And now I perish by my own hand. My blood shall be upon my own head. So why is it that you are anchored this morning on a spot where you have heard so often the appeal of the gospel that was intended for you and no other? To paraphrase Mark 16, 16, Believe on the Lord Jesus and be baptized and you shall be saved. This is the gospel we are told to preach to every creature. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Who do, he who does not believe shall be condemned. And if condemned, your blood shall be upon your own head. Remember the number two yellow pencil? You will act in, in your own interest as you see that interest. So we appeal to you today to act in the best interest of your soul and respond to the call of the gospel as we now stand and sing. <clears throat>